Hello and welcome to Windows Server 2012, Cluster in a Box, RDMA, and more. Um, you'll already see that uh, you're in a little bit different of a session than some of the other ones you may have attended. We have some interesting stuff sitting in front of our podium that we'll be showing you more of later. Um, but first, uh, let me uh, introduce ourselves. And for that, we'll also take advantage of one other extra piece. We have a video camera here to be able to let you see things up close. Even if you're in the back, you should be able to get a good view. Hello, my name is John Lovell. I'm a principal program manager at Microsoft in the server storage and availability team. Um, I've been working with hardware and operating systems my whole career. Um, about the last half of it has been in the storage area. And for the last couple of years, I've been working with the industry to help deliver a, an availability platform along with Windows Server 2012. And I'll be talking about those solutions here today in depth. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jose Barreto. I'm a program manager with the file server team. And uh, I'm going to be talking about the SMB Direct and RDMA technologies in the second half of this talk. And I'm also functioning as a pointer in the first half of the talk. Thank you, Jose. All right, well, let's switch back over to the slides and um, use this to tell you a little bit about the story um, for the hardware solution. How many people here have lived through at least two Windows Server releases? Excellent. How about three releases? Very good, a lot of you. Um, I say three releases because that's about the last 10 years or so. And if you think about it, there really hasn't been a huge demand in terms of changes in the hardware over those releases. Um, typically, the conversation that happens is with, uh, with Microsoft and the system builders. We'll make sure that they're qualifying the release, and they'll make sure that they're on time. And if it's in the customer, you, the audience, um, typically when a server release happens, um, you need to make sure that any of your planned purchases and, uh, and build-outs are going to purchase hardware that will be compatible with the server release eventually when you roll it out. So something's different with this release. And if uh, this session is designed to let you know what that's all about. In fact, we're looking to change the conversation a lot. What we'd like to have you realize is that there's a major change coming in the kind of hardware that will be available for you to build your systems. And we've been working with the system partners, our hardware partners, to design and create these boxes. And what we want to let you know is that now, with this release, you'll have some different choices coming. And this session will tell you the story of why that is so, what's different about this release, what's different about the hardware. And there's a lot of stuff going on inside the box. And for those kinds of things, we'll need to not just talk about it, but also show you. So Jose will be showing you some demos about RDMA, um, because that's the kind of uh, hardware that you really need to see in action to appreciate. And I will be taking uh, some time to explain what's in this box up on stage and show you kind of in detail what to expect inside these new systems that will be available for you to purchase. So with that, we're going to go through a few stages. First, the point. Why do we need a volume platform for availability? What's the change? Uh, what, what drove uh, this effort? Take you inside. I'll show you some interesting things in the hardware. And then we'll also talk about RDMA, a very interesting feature that is coming with support in Windows Server 2012. And then finally, a few words about what to expect in the future, where, how we think you should think about using these new building blocks as you design uh, your deployments, your own systems um, moving ahead. First, though, the volume platform for availability. The story for the cluster in a box basically begins with the story of Windows Server 2012. If you've been attending some of the sessions, especially some of the overview sessions about this new server release, um, you're getting an impression for the huge number of features and scenarios that are supported um, in the software. One of the biggest changes that was done in the planning for this release was that we cleared everyone's plates prior to the planning effort. Previous releases of server Typically what happened was each technology team with their local expertise in their technology would understand their roadmap and bring to the table all the next features they would want to deploy in the next generation of Windows Server. Once we got all those features together, we'd understand how they might interact, and eventually by the time release happens, we would understand kind of the story that was being told. 
Sometimes that story was great. Sometimes that story needed some work. Uh, I think everyone here that raised their hands understands that. Um, one of the things that completely changed this time was planning. There was a, more than a year, probably actually almost close to two years of primary research and planning and investigation done prior to anyone committing to features for this release. Part of what happened there was a research into the customer base and really trying to understand what the customer needs were independent of the technology roadmaps. And this slide represents the kind of work that was done. Thousands of individual customer conversations um, globally, both the United States, uh, Europe, um, Asia, understanding what was needed. This was then reduced through a numbers of sessions and customer-focused design methodologies to really five primary areas of investment for um, Windows Server 2012. One of the primary areas that surfaced through all the conversations was availability. Uh, customers from small businesses to large enterprises, um, like I said, globally, all saw the value in availability. And not just um, in terms of the general sense, but actually to the point where it was seen as critical, that it was absolutely required in future solutions for Windows Server, and indeed all server systems, that it stay up and provide access. So what do we mean by availability? Um, one of the things that we realize is that there's technology and then there's customer scenarios. Um, in the previous releases, we've had availability technology. Windows failover clustering has been with us for many years. And it operates, it works to a certain level, it has a certain number of complexities to it. Um, but what the customers were asking for was not that. What the customers were asking for, what you were asking for, was uptime. And so we had to define a new term. We started using continuously available or continuous availability to remind ourselves that this was not about a technology layer. This was about an end customer value. And what was wanted was the ability to survive a failure and not lose data and not lose um, uptime for your applications. Ultimately, that was the need. So the question became, as we thought about this, is, well, what might be driving it? Once we understood there was such a strong need that your demand was, give us uptime, the question was, why? What is driving this? There's always been an ongoing demand for this, but why now? What's happening? Well, how many of you went to the keynote with Brad Anderson um, at the start of the conference? Great. If you, I'm sure you got a sense there of the scale of the kinds of things we're trying to do with this release, extending up to the cloud. Now, if you remember, there were a number of attributes to the cloud. And so if you remember some of the things that were talked about, there were things like scalability, um, flexibility, um, and the ability to be up. So availability was a huge aspect of the cloud. And so we started to realize that, well, the world's actually changing. Part of what people are looking for is moving beyond just the ability to have something running and actually moving to the point where you can rely on it running so you can then move on and move on into huge new applications that involve cloud resources, mobility, recovery, in ways that you've never tried before. Um, but all start somewhere, and that really, the keystone of that we realized was availability. There are some technologies that were making this possible. We've had the rise of virtualization, and we're seeing some statistics now that the number of virtualized instances is exceeding the planned deployment of physical instances of server hardware. Um, the density of data so that the, num the amount of storage you can store in a single system is now in the tens of terabytes and getting higher. So basically, the amount of dependency that you have on a given piece of hardware has reached a critical tipping point where with one box going out, if there's not an availability solution, you can lose an entire business, an entire branch office. You can lose the data associated with that business or branch office, and access now means business stops. And I think the, the, the conclusion we reached by looking at the studies was that is why all of you and all of the customers we talked to around the world were now realizing that availability is no longer a high-end enterprise niche area, uh, but actually is becoming uh, table stakes for any server solution. You've seen from some of the sessions, if you've been going to the availability sessions uh, during this conference, that there's an enormous amount of work that had to go into the operating system to make that true. Not just in storage, not just in uh, file server, but actually across the teams and technologies and Windows. So there's a lot of stuff, as you might have heard, coming in the box to give you what you've asked for availability. So what's the problem? Why are we talking about hardware? Well, the problem was, while there's a lot of stuff coming in the box, 
we need to do something about the box you'd be buying it in. What this slide shows is along the bottom, the classic range of low end is low cost, low expertise typically required to manage. At the other end, on the right side, is high cost enterprise, where you are willing to spend more money, but you also have a lot more expertise to apply. So today, the solution, um, the entry solution you see on the left, is a classic single server. Uh, no availability story, but it's low cost. It's typically well understood how to buy and deploy these boxes. If you want availability, the market that's grown around it has been typically for the enterprise. So you can build a Windows failover cluster. Uh, you can put together the components. It requires multiple servers. It's required external storage arrays as the shared storage solution. And you can see that the vertical axis is just, just trying to describe the SLA, the service level agreement. What's the promise of the features you get from these solutions? Um, for enterprise high availability, this has been the high end of the market. So you get a lot of features, everything from disk performance monitoring to advanced replication to advanced technology usages and sub one tiering for solid state storage. Everything you can imagine has been there. But you can see there's a big gap. And what's missing has been a solution still on the left side, not requiring significant IT expertise, but delivering high availability. The idea would be to every place you could go buy a server at that same location, say your favorite website, where you're buying your server requirements. If you were looking to, say, buy two servers, the idea with the vision here is that you'd be able to do no more than really click give me availability and be able to purchase and deploy that box with confidence that you do not need to know much more about availability than that. So that's what this center category is all about. Now, if you'll notice, the features in the middle are not the same. In other words, anybody that's been involved in bringing a volume solution to market knows that you can't simply take the high-end solution and move it downward. That it's not just a matter of price. Um, it's not really just a matter of packaging. You're really talking about a different requirement set to move a technology to a high-volume product. So the list in the middle is meant to focus on that. So you need availability. The HACA part is a given. Um, but the other thing you require is you need a simple out-of-box experience, or UBI as we call it. This needs to be, a tri this needs to be deployable by companies or people, individuals even, without significant IT expertise. We can't expect that people have clustering knowledge, that people have the experience from the past to know even what to buy. In addition to that, we need to offer people the same kinds of choices they have today when buying servers. Another thing you can't do when you're bringing a new technology to market is to say, great, you can have availability, but you're not really going to be able to do a lot of the things you're used to with your systems. You're going to have to compromise a lot in the kinds of system choices, in the kinds of storage choices. Um, you have to give up a lot to get into availability. In order to do that, we had to bring back some technology. So today's server purchases, you have a large selection of software RAID and hardware RAID choices for storage. So we did the work in this release to bring back into mainstream clustered cluster-capable solutions of both software RAID. You might have gone to storage spaces discussions here. You'll learn about our new virtualization layer in the OS. And then we also worked with partners to make sure there was an availability of hardware RAID. So we worked with partners such as LSI to bring out a high availability version of their RAID solution. All of that came together so that we could be able to produce a volume platform. Now, the next thing you need to worry about when you're producing something for volume is that the end customer expects a tailored solution. This has to be something that really just works for their business. You can't ship a technology kit and expect people to put it together. You can do that for a high-end enterprise, but not for a volume solution. So we had to focus on targeted customer scenarios. Now, we're talking about this, as I said, we, the vision is that any place you could go buy a server, you could click high availability. But to really make that solution work, and if you're really in a volume market, you really require the partners, our hardware partners and their software efforts, to customize those solutions. Here are three key scenarios that we see as the leading, um, the leading um, applications for these solutions probably in the first couple of years. Um, the first two are everything in a box. So whether you're a small business and you're running your entire business from one box, or you're a remote or branch office, where you're running all the operations for that branch on a single box. For these, this is something where you would run your workloads and you would have all of your compute, networking, and storage enclosed in a single chassis, assuming it's high availability. 
The, the last scenario is something quite different. This category uses the same hardware, but this now is a focused storage capability. So with this release in Windows Server 2012, if you've seen the kinds of features we're doing with storage, with file server, and performance, um, you're starting to get an idea for the story here that says, we're coming out with a box that basically is world class when it comes to offering up external storage and file storage. That is the other application for the same hardware that if you take the same hardware, configure it as the file server, you can now use it as a building block in larger deployments, rack deployments, data center deployments. The requirements are very different. Um, the first two are assuming low IT expertise. Well, not necessarily. If you're in a branch office, typically you'll have a central office where there could be very, very significant IT expertise. But how many of here support branch operations in your business? Great. How many here think you have a lot of extra time to handle all of your branch issues when they come up? Right. The problem with this world is that um, resources are always being constrained, as you know. So if you even have branch offices and you have IT expertise that can handle this, what you require is the ability to have these things easily deployable, remotely manageable, um, so that um, you can fan out across an increasing number of systems and user population without increasing your own time or your own resources. Cloud data centers are a little bit different. For this, what you really need is the ability to configure this box in the performance and scale that you require. So here, a lot of what you need is the raw power of the hardware and the ability to have choices to buy it at a reasonable cost so you can buy it in large quantities to build out and scale out as big of an operation as you want. Now, a lot of this stuff points out some of the opportunity, actually. Microsoft is doing a lot. The features we're putting into Windows Server 2012 are enormous. Um, if, as you've seen across the board, not just in storage, not just in availability, but from Hyper-V to the cloud services to um, remote management, this is, a, this is quite a transformational release. For this solution, we're also working with our partners. The last mile, the, the other part of completing these solutions is for the partner to configure it, assemble it, pre-image it, and set it up so that when you get it, it's basically functional. And so that's why it's so important to focus on customer scenarios because ultimately we're relying on our partners, you basically your vendors, to handle the final integration and put together solutions that just work. That's the story behind the cluster in the box. This is why we had to work to create a new solution. Um, now the question is, well, what's inside this thing? Um, what, what defines a cluster in the box? If you've been wandering around the uh, Technical Learning Center or the Tech Expo, you've probably seen some signs that uh, some partners are out there showing you cluster in a box solutions. So the question is, well, what is this? Um, what are we talking about? Um, an important thing to remember here is that this is not a solution. Remember that what we're trying to do is actually transform the technology. Um, there's a few examples of technology that, is, that, have, that have gone through this. If you think back, middle 80s to mid 90s, multiprocessor technology was coming into its own. When it started out, um, the ability to support multiprocessing was specialty items. It, was a, it required custom work on the operating system. Um, but over time, and by the mid 90s, and especially today, um, it just works. You don't really even think to specify what you need to support it. You really just assume that when you purchase it, all you need to do is tell me how many processors, um, tell me what it costs, and I'm assuming that the operating system and the hardware just give me the capability to use it without thinking. There was another transition like that um, between the mid-90s and the mid-2000s, networking rose into its own. What used to be requiring expertise to understand and specify and purchase and set up in networking technologies through the, through the boom of the web days, um, this technology has become mainstream. Today, when you buy a system, you simply assume that networking works. You may have to deal with your own topology and your own layout, but as far as what happens inside the box, um, this is just assumed to work. So what's happening now is availability is coming into that same trend. So availability, if you think about it, even in the last five years, available systems have been a specialty item, something that you think about when you have a special requirement and you go to specialized partners to look at hardware solutions. What's happening now is where the problem is to bring availability to a, to a mainstream audience. Um, so how many people here have actually worked with and installed Windows clustering? Quite a few. Uh, very good. Um, how many of you would say that this is a technology that's ready for a mainstream volume deployment to low expertise customers? Exactly. 
that's the problem. This release is not so much saying that availability now works. Sometimes we get that question saying, well, what's new? What's new is we had to solve the problem of how do you in, in basically enable this transition? How do you take a technology that up until now has been expensive, a specialty item, and make it so it's just part of the base foundation? And that really has been the work we've done in this release with the hardware partners to make real. If you went to the previous discussion just before this one about the path to continuous availability, um, one of the conclusions you would have seen there is that a lot of the work was to make it easy to set up. So many of the defaults in the software are on. Um, we will simply discover the equipment available. We will do the right thing in as many cases as we can. We still give you the ability to turn off that behavior, but a lot of the work was to set up so that you didn't have to think about it. So the goal here is how do you take that all the way to the hardware, and how do you get it so you can purchase systems that will deliver? So one of the first things that we had to make sure, I mean, the primary um, point of the system is that it's up. So the key aspect of a cluster in a box is that it survived the failure and repair of a single component while still giving you access to your data and your applications. That really is the tone setting for the whole, for the, for the whole approach. One thing is we're not specific, this is not a fixed solution. This is not something that we've diagrammed and architected and we'll be releasing a single version. This is a wave. So with the utmost requirement being technology that allows you to survive failure, um, it gets into more details. So clearly for power, you need to have redundant power supplies. Those power supplies need to cover the entire domain of the box. You need to have clearly more than one so you can survive failure of that component. You, to make this simple, you need to be able to have all of the cabling associated with clustering enclosed in the box. As I said, if you saw the, the cloud requirements for the base system, it's compute, it's storage, and it's networking. You have to have the cabling required to provide those when it's all in one box. It really needs to live inside. It needs to come pre-wired and pre-configured. Um, there needs to be flexibility. Um, you need to be able to still provide the same kinds of choices you have today with, stand, with single servers. You need to be able to offer choices. Thus, you should have expansion slots so you can provide your own networking controllers, your own other hardware add-ons, just as you would for today's market. There has to be expansion. Not, this is not one size fits all. So we've been specifying expansion, uh, storage expansion as a primary um, attribute of these systems. And then finally, this is a new market. So while talking to people about what they expect in a high availability system, even the system builders, the OEMs, the designers, you tend to talk to people that have been working in the enterprise server world probably their, their, their entire time in that product category. And one of the changes of this is, well, now we're talking about things like lawyers' offices, dentists' offices, small stores, even branch offices that may or may, may be fairly small. This is an opportunity for true uh, consumer-grade systems in terms of office acoustics and office power. Can you really produce a system that you can put under someone's desk that can serve as their business in a box? It's a real opportunity to take the same technology and move it into an area that previously um, was not considered at all by a lot of the teams that have been designing these boxes. And, of course, by a lot of you that have been purchasing them. So if that's what's inside the box, the next question is, okay, um, what, what, can we, um, what, 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 are your, what are your choices really going to be when it comes to partners? At this show, again, if you've been walking through the Tex Expo, you've been seeing a number of partners that have been involved in this work. There's a lot of that we can mention by name. In fact, you'll see a lot, of our, a lot of our friends here that have been producing advanced solutions that are coming out with some boxes that are going to be available right with purchase. The curtain on the bottom is a reminder that one of the fun things that we do at Microsoft is we get to talk to everybody. And one of the fun things I've been able to do for the last few years is talk to just about everybody you can think of that is in the server business. So we've been getting this message out pretty loud, pretty clear for quite some time. And there's some amazing things that are still on their way that you haven't heard of. So take a look in the Tech Expo, understand what's out there now, keep your eyes open uh, as we get closer to release and closer to the end of the year. There are some very interesting developments that are coming that uh, you'll probably want to know more about. Now, in detail, well, here's some examples of this hardware. Um, one of the first things to take away from the slide is uh, across the top, these boxes are very different. Again, we're not specifying a single solution. This is not a cluster in a box spec that you need to comply with with um, sample reference hardware designs. This is, this is a, a set of features that we're encouraging system builders to provide 
including all of their standard value add, all of the kinds of choices you would expect from server purchases. So you can see HP has their X5000, which has actually been released on server 2008 R2. We've also worked with a couple of names you may not have heard of. So here's WeWin, which is actually a, a division of, of Wistron, and then Quanta. These are two names that have typically been associated with the ODM market. This is original design manufacturer. And if you're not familiar with that, the way the world has worked for a number of years now is that the OEMs, for a lot of their hardware, especially volume platforms, actually rely on other firms. These are called original design manufacturers to design and manufacture their systems. Um, the OEM then, of course, does all the great things they do with, with service, support, sales, um, defining the roadmap. Um, but the hardware itself has come from companies like WeWin and like Quanta. The reason we ended up working with those companies is because they do fuel a lot of the supply for volume platforms for our OEM partners. Um, this is a way to make sure that the hardware you've asked for, availability hardware, is actually available from the partners you're used to buying servers from. So we've done a lot of work to do this. And you can look at the table. The main thing to take away here is that in detail, they're very different. They're different in terms of their, their fit and function, their size. Um, even their storage capacity and the choices they've made about the kinds of pieces and hardware and networking connections they put together. Does it look familiar? Hopefully, because that's really the kind of choices you have today when you're buying a standard server. And again, the whole idea is to make it so you can buy a standard server, look at the same kinds of features you're used to requiring, and just simply say, no, I, I really want the availability one, and click that. So that's what's coming here. These are actually the kinds of systems that are now in this box sitting down in front of you. So let me talk a little bit about this thing in the front of the stage. So a little bit different than your standard setup for um, overall for um, heart for these kinds of sessions. Um, when you're putting on a show like this, you have to think big. So we wanted to run this hardware live for our demos um, on site at the Tech Edge shows. So that's great. That's, that's an interesting idea. But you can't just bring one of those. Um, you actually have to bring a full backup in case something goes wrong. That's what's sitting in front of you. If you've, again, if you've managed to make it by the Technical Learning Center, the Microsoft High Availability Booth, there is a large rack that looks similar to this one. Actually, it's a little bit prettier. There's a, you know, the sheet metal. It's a show rack. It has winking and blinking lights, though, because it actually is running the demos that you're seeing during the course of this, of this uh, TechEd conference for high availability. So we did the work to pull together the prototypes and pre-release hardware in many cases um, to put the system together. Here we have the complete backup. So for coming here today, the benefit you get is you get to actually see this hardware up close in ways that we can't pull apart because that rack is running. In fact, Jose um, actually had to present using, uh, using that equipment just before this, just before this show, this, this session here. So this is, this is live. Um, what we're going to do now, though, is basically walk you through what's inside of this rack so you get a feeling for the actual hardware itself. Um, what we've done is we put together a complete stack. Now, this looks like a big box, so I don't want you to take away the message that says, oh, I saw the cluster in a box at John's uh, session. John and Jose showed it to me. Um, it's really big. <laughs> in fact, it took up, it was mostly the height of Jose. Um, so no, that's not the cluster in a box. This is a demo rack that actually contains two complete cluster in a box systems, along with all of the other system components needed to provide full demos. Um, first, though, a shout out. We could only do this work with the help from our friends. And so a lot of vendors have, uh, have contributed equipment and time and support to make this happen. So you can see we have cluster box prototypes from Quanta and WeWin. Um, LSI is providing the high availability um, uh, Mega RAID controllers and SAS controllers that we're using in the various configurations here. Um, Mellanox is providing the high speed networking because this is also set up to do some performance demos using the same box. Again, file server and performance are an amazing option for the Windows Server 2012 release. And then finally, OCZ has provided some SSDs. And if you've seen, I think even in the keynote, they mentioned that, uh, well, some of these demos could use hundreds of disk drives, but OK, we really need to provide something that rolls on a single case. So uh, SSDs and at the current state are an amazing technology to get performance in a small package. So that's the whole overall setup. Um, but now let me walk you through the, the subcomponents, basically the individual configurations. So first up, we put together what we call a performance configuration. So for this one, we chose the Quanta CIB. And again, we, we could choose either of the CIBs. These are fully configurable. We chose the Quanta CIB. We've used the LSI HA DAS Mega RAID controllers for clustered um, hardware RAID. And we're using the OCZ SAS HDDs uh, to combine it for a performance storage capacity. Um, 
We have a, a set of Quanta application servers that are driving the load, and finally, uh, Mellanox has provided the high-speed networking. So let me switch over so you can actually see the components here. Hey, it works. Jose is, has a, for, for a real hardware display, you can't, you, what you need is, the screens are nice, but you actually need a real hardware pointer. So Jose has volunteered to be the real hardware pointer for our real hardware today at the session. So um, what he can do is he can pan down. So you can see at the top we have, this is the, we pulled it out so you can actually get a feeling for the separate box. This is the Quanta cluster in a box. You see it's a 2U unit. It has a storage, storage um, modules up front. The, the, in the rear are the accessibility for the blades and the power supplies. This is being driven then in the rack. We have a similar looking unit, which is the Quanta um, servers. So what you see here is that this is a similar looking box that has four servers we're using to drive the, the server application workloads to show it as a file, as a file server. And then finally on the bottom, um, you can see that we have the Wistron unit, which is, the, uh, which is we're using for our, our value configuration. Up towards the top of the rack is our networking infrastructure. If you move up to the top, you can see we have the switches there for the, for the Mellanox, um, InfiniBand, FDR, um, uh, capability both, and those are connected then to the FDR um, NICs in the boxes. So let me switch back and talk about the, uh, the next configuration. So we put together what we call a value configuration. So for this one, we chose the WeWin cluster in a box. We outfitted it instead of the LSI HA-DAS mega rate controllers. We're now using standard LSI SAS controllers, and these are hooked up to standard um, SAS rotating media hard disk drives. Um, we've connected those again, still driven by the Quanta application servers, and we've now cooked it up with um, e um, Ethernet, both uh, 10 gig E as well as 1 gig E connections. So this is another way to deploy these. Again, the choices you're starting to see are the standard choices you're expecting from servers. Disks, uh, um, networking connections, um, uh, configurations. Um, so that this is, the, and finally, there's the, uh, the, the third configuration that we're able to support with this rack is the true business or branch in a box. So you can see here, the diagram gets a lot simpler. Again, we've chosen the Wistron, uh, the WeWin CIB, but all there is on the outside is really just a switch to connect you to the network. This is more of the classic um, standalone business in a box configuration. So if we switch back to the, uh, the box itself, um, as they'll point down, the, this bottom unit, Again, this is a 3U unit, again, storage in the front, but you'll see that it actually has small form factor disk drives, 24 of them actually, compared to the other, the, the Quanta, which chose to put in 12 large form factor disk drives. That box, standalone, will also be a cluster in a box. And the unit on the very top, which we pulled out to give you a, a feeling for just the size of it, again, it's not the, the, the box is not the travel case, it's actually the, the server itself, is the Quanta cluster in a box. Great, well, thank you, Jose. Hey, let's give Jose a hand for being the human pointer. Thank you. <laughs> Not a normal job description for session speaking at TechEd. <laughs> but let me take a second here. Since, since we're all here and we have the camera, I actually wanted to take a moment to show you some of the insides of this box, which is one of the reasons we pulled it out. So you can see here, this again, it looks like your standard 2U server, um, nothing special about it, which is good. This is meant to look and feel and deploy just like a standard server. Um, but if I go around to the back, I want to show you some of the kinds of things we're talking about. So these kinds of boxes, if it were running, you should be able to pull out small pieces like this and not have to worry about it. This is a power supply. There are actually two of them. Now, you can't pull out both. Remember, failure of a single component is key. But this is the kind of technology that typically you would expect to find on high availability hardware for the enterprise market. The idea here is that not just, not just modular power supplies, but the fact that they're hot pluggable and that each power supply supports the full domain of the box. In other words, you have to be able to support um, both blades and storage from a single power supply in case one fails. The idea here is also you need to be able to, for example, pull a blade and have it not interrupt the operation of the other node and the storage so that the power supply needs to be able to function um, equivalently well regardless of, of, of the number of functioning blades in the box. Now, one thing I like about the Quanta system is that when I pull out one of these blades, it actually is, allows me to show you some real hardware in the box. So this is kind of fun. So if you can close in right here, you can see some of the stuff we're talking about. This here is the LSI um, high availability mega rate card. You can see that it, there's some, maybe, if any of you have ever opened up a high availability um, external uh, RAID enclosure, you are going to see something similar to this. Basically, what we have here are two connections to a large crossover card, 
which contains the hardware, the SAS expander hardware, that allows this card to talk to the storage um, as well as the other node and have redundancy so that if a failure happens in either one of the connections or one of the expanders, it'll be able to still have access to the other, the other ports on the SAS drives. So basically what you're seeing here is what you'd see on the insides of a high availability external storage array. And that's one of the things that differentiates this kind of solution. It's built into the box so that you don't have to worry about not only just choosing which storage array would work with the solution, but also installing it, getting the cabling right, all of the kinds of things that um, people without expertise, experience doing this, uh, just get wrong. And because they get it wrong, it means it's not really ready as a volume solution. Now this is one example of this kind of blade architecture. Um, just to give you a flavor that these things are different, let me go ahead and pull out one of the blades from the Wistron box, the, the, from WeWin. So if I reach down here, this guy's a little bit different. I may have to jockey the hardware here. Hold on. There we go. There we are. So now the first thing you'll notice, besides the fact that it's covered in sheet metal, and that's one of the reasons I use the other blade to show, is that it's quite a different size. Uh, if you notice, this, this blade, and okay, I think I can do this. Hold on. There we go. These two blades are very different looking. Um, this one weighs my arm down quite a bit more. Um, it's a lot bigger. It also fits in a 3U box. And one of the advantages of changing the form factor is that if I turn this around, let the camera get in right close there, you'll see that it has expansion slots on both sides of the blade. So here, one of the advantages is with more room, you can offer more possibility for adding expansion. So you can add not only the other NIC cards, you can also add special function cards as you might for a regular server. But the trade-off, of course, would be size, size and some power. So these are both examples. Put this down. There we go. Of the kinds of boxes that you can, that the kinds of alternatives that partners are providing in providing in doing these kinds of solutions. Um, so I hope you get a feeling now for um, the components to make this up, the fact that internal cabling is important, being able to make the choices for you so you can deploy these at volume is really important. Now, I'd like to switch it over so we can talk about a technology uh, that's also part of the hardware story inside these boxes, and that's the story of RDMA. And for that, I'll turn it back over to Jose. All right. Thank you. I think I know what to do here. Give us a minute. <laughs> we need highly available projection <laughs> systems. That's number one, and I'll switch it over. It's still blinking. There we Yay. go. Hey, pay over. All right, folks. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about RDMA, which is a technology that used to be only for high-performance computing in the past. And in this release in Windows Server 2012, we are delivering as something that you can just use for your regular file server workloads using SMB 3.0. So the basic idea here is we want to provide a solution that provides you high performance uh, for a file configuration using very low uh, CPU utilization. So what we're talking about here is having a file server that performs really well at the level you would expect from uh, previous uh, solutions like Fiber Channel without having to have the same requirements. Using just your regular uh, TCP IP networking, we couldn't deliver that. So at this point, if you think about it, we can use multiple 10 gigabit uh, Ethernet solutions in Windows. It's no problem doing that. We have demonstrated that we can do one 10 gig NIC, two 10 gig NICs, four 10 gig NICs, and we can drive that. The problem now is that when you're using that kind of technology, your CPU utilization starts going up. Why is that? Because when you're transferring data between these two systems, if you don't have an RDMA interface, we have to chop all the data on one side, send it through these multiple NICs, and get it on the other side. And because we're doing this for a whole lot of data, the CPU starts to climb up. So we demonstrated four times 10 gig in some of these configurations, and sometimes we're using two cores, three cores, four cores to the full capacity while doing these high 
throughput workloads. How do we get this kind of throughput without that CPU utilization? And another thing is latency. When you have to do all this uh, chopping uh, of the data on one end and reassembly of the data on the other side, we increase the latency between these two systems. How can we reduce the latency of those transfers? So the main thing here is leveraging hardware that's already available today for high performance computing that allows the NICs themselves to talk and perform the transfer on your behalf. While you only have to say, okay, I want to transfer data from memory on this system to that other remote system. That's why we call it remote direct memory access. So what we do is we say, oh, I want to transfer data. Please send the data to this memory location. The NICs themselves talk and they perform the transfer. There are different ways to do this. There's technologies called iWarp, InfiniBand, Rocky that works in different fashion. Let's look at some of uh, the details on how, uh, how does it happen. So a simple way to think about it, we want to transfer data as fast as possible. We want to, uh, to avoid this whole process of chopping data, transferring to the other side and reassembling. So what we do, imagine if you will, I want to read some data from the file server to a file client. Let's say I have a SQL over SMB scenario and we're using SMB to transfer the data. We're loading a lot of data. So instead of actually sending pieces of that data over the wire, we, on the SQL side, we say, oh, I need to read some data into this memory area. So on the SQL side, we say, okay, let's say we want to transfer 512K of data. We register the memory where we want to da the data to be transferred to and we register that with the NIC on our side, the RDMA NIC. Then we get a token out of that. We send that token with the request to the other side. And when the other side gets that token, instead of saying transfer the data over the wire to me bit by bit, essentially we're saying, you know how to do direct memory access. So just drop the data in this location and we pass the token. On the other end, we do all that's necessary to read the data from disk, and then the other system, instead of trying to do this bit by bit, it connects the two NICs and says, okay, I'm gonna transfer directly to the other side, and because it knows the token of the memory location on the other end, the two NICs actually do the work all by themselves. And then when it's done, we get a notification saying, okay, the transfer is on the other side, and we just move forward with that. So instead of trying to do all this work through the regular GCP IP stack, we actually let the NICs working at full speed do the work while the CPU on both ends is doing other things. So if it's a SQL server, we could be using that to index our database, to perform the queries, to do all the other things that SQL servers do, okay? The different technologies that we use are illustrated here. And they all use different mechanisms to do this transfer over the wire. So at the top, you see that we have the traditional non-RDMA networking, where uh, up to this point, we see up to 10 gigabits per second available. And when you try to do a lot of stuff, because we have to do all this work, we have higher CPU utilization, right? Now, if you go to the first option, which is iWarp, iWARP is two NICs that talk through the TCP IP stack that they have inside the NICs. There's some people get confused and say, so iWARP uses TCP IP. Yes, iWARP is essentially RDMA over TCP IP, but the TCP IP stack doesn't live on the Windows OS, it lives actually inside the NICs themselves. So we start the conversation when the NICs talk to each other, they use TCP IP. There are some advantages to that. So for instance, we can work with any kind of switch because it's just regular uh, uh, TCP IP. You can even route that traffic across different switches and all that works. And we have a couple of different vendors that uh, offer that solution for us. So we have the Intel NEO20 and uh, the new RDMA partner was recently announced, Chelsea, that has a series of uh, adapters uh, called the T4 family that provide that capability as well. However, there is another way to do it. If you go to the bottom of 
the list here, we have something called InfiniBand, which is an entirely different way of doing things. It has nothing to do with Ethernet. It provides very, very fast speeds up to 54 gigabits per second. So we have a couple of different cards from Mellanox that provide that. One is the Connect X2, the other one is Connect X3. Uh, the Connect X3, which is the one we're going to use for a demo in a second, is the one that offers up to 54 gigabits per second. Now, although this is a different kind of networking technology, they provide something which is called IP over IB, so you can do regular GCP IP traffic on it. And you can assign IP addresses just the same way that you do. SMB will detect the RDMA capability, though, and when it finds that, it will switch to this more efficient mode to do the transfers. Now, in the middle, we have something called Rocky, which is another way to think about this, which is the transfer between the two NICs uses raw Ethernet. So instead of you sending TCP IP packets or sending InfiniBand, you use Ethernet as the communication between the two. This is something that the Mellanox card can also uh, offer. They have different modes for, for doing things. And when you do that, we have seen speeds both 10 gig and 40 gig. The limitation there on uh, when you're doing Ethernet base is that Ethernet doesn't provide routing. So you have to actually have a switch connecting the two together. So different technologies, different things you can do. Some of them are routable through uh, TCP IP. Some of them are not. Some are very fast. Some are 10 gig. And uh, 10 gig is actually a lot of bandwidth. And you combine this with our ability to do multi-channel in SMB, which means you can aggregate multiple of those. So we can do 2 times 10, 4 times 10, 2 times 54, maybe even 3 times 54, as we have demonstrated here. A little bit of detail on how this happens. So first of all, we want to clarify that you do not need to think about RDMA. We work with the Microsoft team that does networking to provide this shared infrastructure that vendors can use called the Network Direct Kernel Mode interface so that you can simply say at the higher level, I want to do backslash, backslash, file server name, backslash, share name. So this works in Explorer. If you're in Explorer and you drop a file to a share, you are naturally using RDMA. If you're using Hyper-V over SMB, if you saw my session just before this one, you don't have to do anything different. You just use an UNC path, and it just works. How does this work? Well, essentially, SMB itself, when you connect to the other side, it always starts with TCP IP. Because there's no guarantee that the other side has RDMA or it can even talk SMB 3.0, which is required for this scenario. So first thing that happens in the number two there is we connect to the other side. After we connect to the other side, we exchange some information about network interfaces and capabilities. And then we can discover the fact that RDMA is available. If it is, then SMB will switch to RDMA connections instead of regular TCP IP connections. Now, all this negotiation happens while workloads could be running, right? So you start the connection, you start doing TCP IP as you should. If we can manage to establish an RDMA connection, we will start doing that instead of regular TCP IP, okay? And then we switch from the stack on that side that shows TCP IP to the stack on the other side that shows SMB Direct, and you see the thin layer of the NDK uh, that we uh, use to communicate with the RDMA NIC. The short story, though, here is we have a few partners working with us to implement these technologies, and we got a lot of help from the networking team to essentially provide this plumbing. And SMB is now offering both TCP IP and SMB Direct as means of communications, and we're doing this automatically. I want to talk a little bit about the partners that are helping us here. Uh, we uh, have a, a picture here of the Mellanox Connect X3. So this is an interesting card. It's a PCIe Gen 3 card that can do 54 uh, gigabits a second, and it also has a mode that can do 40 uh, gigabits per second over Ethernet. So you can do InfiniBand or you can do Rocky, right? Uh, this is a card that has an uh, inbox driver for Windows. So if you have this kind of card, you just load Windows. It will automatically detect and use this capability. 
There are some details to be had. We have Mellanox here with a booth that can talk a lot about what we're going to do, and we're going to use this in the demo as well. We also have the 10 gig uh, Intel NEO20, which is an iWarp card. We have also drivers for this card inbox since beta. And essentially, it allows you to just connect regular 10 gig networking through regular uh, switches. And this card has been uh, used in the HPC market for a while now, uh, as have, uh, has the Mellanox card. And we have a new partner that was announced at PacEd North America, which is Chelsea. So Chelsea does uh, 10 gigabit, also iWarp adapters. And in this case, they have options for two port 10 gig. And one that I find especially interesting is a four port card. So in some configurations, as you will see, we have different networks, for instance, dual networks to be the connectivity between the nodes in a cluster, then dual connections in a, in a NIC team going to the outside for external access to that. So with one single card of these, you can actually manage all these things. And uh, this is a PCI Gen 2, so you actually can't achieve 40 gigabits because of the bus limitation, but you can get pretty close. You can get over uh, 30 gigabits per second out of a single card uh, in the multiple paths that you have there. So not, not bad at all, different uh, wiring connections. Uh, this card doesn't have inbox drivers. We're working with them to provide that. There's a URL there for downloading the NDK uh, driver for this. And if you load that driver, then SMB will start recognizing that card. One thing that's kind of interesting is that when you're doing this kind of uh, network configuration, these cards do not feel any different from a regular networking card. So you can do ping with those cards. You can actually set an IP address with those cards. All the, the feel for the card is going to be the same, right? Now, when you go uh, to the SMB command line uh, through PowerShell, there's a way to query the NIC to see if it has the RDMA capability. If it does, and there's a command called, uh, for instance, get SMB server network interface that will list the cards that you have on the system, and there's a simple flag to say RDMA yes or no. If you have the response being yes, then that's an RDMA capable interface. What do I do for SMB to engage? Well, you don't have to do anything. You just have to start the workload. SMB will detect if there's RDMA in both ends, we will connect and we'll engage. We also have performance counters to show how, how this works. If you have multiple of those, we will engage both at the same time. Uh, let's do a little uh, demo here. Well, let's look at some, uh, some setups uh, to kind of show some of the capabilities and compare and contrast RDMA with non-RDMA. So this is a demo that we did at the Interop conference a while back. Uh, we had a simple system, a single server, that has a whole lot of uh, SSD PCIe interfaces, Fusion I.O. cards, if you're familiar with those. And in order to get some interesting uh, capability to do lots of I.O., we put four of those Fusion I.O. cards in a box, right? And then we measured what's the local performance. Then we switch over to 10 gig Ethernet, and then we went to 32 gig IB, and then to 56 gig IB. And I can show you a little bit of what the results look like. So I'll highlight the fact that these are not cluster systems. It could have been, but for this specific scenario, because we're using the Fusion I.O. cards, we use just standalone to standalone configuration. In fact, these were back-to-back -back cables. But what you can see here is a very interesting behavior. When we have the non-RDMA 10 gig, we were able to do 1.1 uh, gigabyte a second, which is essentially right line rate for 10 gig. Not bad at all. We can do that. But you see, we were using about 10% of the CPU. Then on the very same hardware, we just started using the RDMA interface. We have QDR numbers, then FDR, which is the 14 data rate capability that gives you the 54 gigabits a second. And what you see here is we're, we're essentially able to leverage the, uh, all the, the performance, the throughput of the four Fusion I.O. Uh, cards, pretty much. So that if you compare to the local performance, local was 5.8. We got 5.79 remote. That's not bad. But look at the CPU utilization. We were doing five times more work, and we're using half of the CPU. Does that make sense? 
Now, this setup, we're using a single card. And effectively, networking was not the bottleneck. The bottleneck was the storage. This card can actually go slightly faster than that. OK? Uh, and then we come to the setup that uh, we have over here. It's a super micro set of servers. There are uh, in the Tech Expo area over here. We have four RAID controllers, each RAID controller connected to a JBOD that has eight SSDs in them, right? So each one of this can give us about two point something uh, gigabytes a second locally, right? And then what we're doing is we're doing this access to those disks remote through SMB 3.0. Now, at this point, we go over the capacity of a single RDMA NIC, so we started using two RDMA NICs, okay? So in this setup, we started first doing remote, and just for fun, we actually used Hyper-V over SMB in the client, and we ran the workload from inside a virtual machine using Hyper-V over SMB, okay? So let's take a look at that configuration. We were actually having uh, some trouble here because one of the trays was not happy this morning. So I'm going to show this as a slight reduced rate today. Uh, in the Tech Ed North America, it had all four trays working. So we were doing about 10 gigabytes a second. Here we're doing 7.8 gigabytes a second, give or take. A very respectable eight times eight, that's 64 gigabits per second, okay? Uh, so essentially what we're doing here, and, and you can take a look, we have a VM. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. That's the file server. We have a VM here. The VM is running a workload that essentially does a lot of I.O. from within the VM, right? This VM is configured with Hyper-V over SMB. If you look at the settings here, you see that I have a few file shares going to each of the trays that I have. So if you look here, the path to the VHD file is actually an SMB file share, okay? And then what you have on this screen is our new performance counters for SMB showing that we're doing about seven and a half gigabytes a second, okay? And we're doing this through two different network interfaces because each network interface is a Connect X3 Mellanox card. So it goes up to 54 gigabits a second. This is uh, higher than that. So what I have here is in my performance monitor, you see that we're hovering around seven, between seven and eight gigabytes uh, a second. I'm gonna actually try something funny here. I'm gonna go in my natural configuration. You see that I have here a few different NICs. So I'm gonna go to the NIC configuration. And uh, because we're using multi-channel, you see that I have two IB interfaces. What I'm going to do here, I'm gonna disable one of them. So when you disable one of the NICs, essentially we have only one of the two IB interfaces available now. Now, notice that the workload did not stop. We're just using a degraded mode because now only one of the paths is available. So this is naturally done by Hyper-V over SMB if you have these kinds of multi-channel configurations. So now we're flat there at about 5.8, which is what one port of a Connect X3 card can give you, okay? Which is about, I would say, five times 10 gigabit ethernet, give it or take, maybe a little higher, right? Just a little bit. Now, better yet, if I re-enable this card, so let's say, for instance, you, for some reason, someone turned off a switch or pulled the cable out. So what you're going to see is that SMB multi-channel automatically detect the fact that the NIC is now available. So while the workload was running, we recover from that situation, go back to full speed. Now our bottleneck is again the storage. In the previous one, the bottleneck was 
the network because we had more storage capacity than we had uh, storage. All right? So this is a little demo of how RDMA works. Uh, one thing that you might have overlooked, and I want to bring it back to kind of show you, look at the CPU utilization on this system. Right? We're running a VM transferring eight, seven gigabytes a second, and we're only using less than 4% of the CPU. Okay? So it's a different, with this one, you could actually go and use two, maybe even three of these cards and do a lot of work and have lots of VMs. You're likely not going to do this from a single VM. You're probably going to have a few. But you can imagine how we can do this kind of remote access without having to uh, think, oh, I'm going to run uh, a lot of my CPU just to do the network traffic. In fact, this feels a lot like when you're using a fiber channel HBA because the fiber channel HBA has this kind of ability to do the work on your behalf, but you're actually doing this using uh, remote file storage with SMB 3.0, okay? So that was essentially my demo. I'm going to have here some of the numbers. So as I mentioned to you, uh, one of our trays is acting up, so we weren't able to get all the way up to 10. But uh, it's a good thing we have some screenshots of what it was uh, with all four trays going at full speed. So we were able to do locally about 10, and remote, we were able to do about 10. Now, there are a few interesting <laughs> numbers. First question is, how can remote be faster than local? Jose, what's going on? Well, there's some effect there. <laughs> I believe it's the pipelining that's going on. We keep a lot of I.O. piled up, and I'm just capturing the numbers and showing them to you. There are smarter people than me that explain how this goes, right? But I want to call attention to CPU utilization numbers. At 10 gig, we were less than 5%, and the latency. Certain workloads, you're very concerned about latency. Local latency, three milliseconds, give it or take. Remote latency, three milliseconds as well. Of course, there might be a, you know, infinitesimal difference between the two, but what does this mean? This means you have remote storage that absolutely feels like local. Throughput's there, latency is the same, and CPU utilization is hovering at the same level, okay? So that's what RDMA can give you. Now imagine this machine running a SQL data warehouse or a few machines connected to a file server that is hosting the data for your data warehouse. Imagine a private cloud with a few hundred, maybe a few thousand VMs running against the file server cluster. Now combine this, this, granted, this is a standalone system. You can, by all means, create clusters with multiple of these interfaces that can achieve that. In a cluster in a box, you'll probably have only one or two uh, uh, of these uh, network interfaces. For discrete systems, you can go bigger, right? In fact, we had a demo from XIO on the TechEd North America that were showing the file server back-ended by a SAN, a fiber channel SAN, with one client talking to three distinct servers with multiple of these cards achieving 15 gigabytes a second or roughly 120 gigabits a second. Single client talking to multiple servers talking to the SAN. The only reason they had to do multiple servers is because they had to use three fiber channel HBAs for every InfiniBand card to match the throughput, so they just couldn't put enough cards in the same system to provide, so they had to spread it across multiple servers. But on the client side, they could put the three cards on a single machine. That's the kind of throughput we're talking about. All right. Oh, that goes into my section. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, hey, seven Back and a half you. gigabytes a second, uh, less than 4% CPU utilization, same latency as local. Zero configuration, RDMA in the box is Windows Server 2012. Come on, is that, let's give a hand. That's impressive stuff. 
It also goes to the notion of what it takes to bring this technology to a volume solution. Zero config, this is high performance computing technology, what it takes to bring it, not just provide it working, but get it so people can actually use it. So we have a few minutes left. Um, what I want to do is, before you guys go to lunch, is just talk a little bit then about what we mean by a building block. Where is this stuff going? Now that we assume that this stuff is available, um, what do you do with it and how do we see it might be changing uh, the kinds of systems you build out? Um, so let's talk about building blocks. Today's building blocks are fairly straightforward. You can start with single node servers. Um, you can add storage to them so you have some ability to scale, uh, scale vertically. If you want to scale out, well, you add more servers. Um, this is great. It's uh, very simple. It's low cost. But there's no availability story. Uh, so this is basically, the, if you remember the previous chart that talked about the market, this is the entry market, um, not really a way for you to get from here uh, to an availability solution without stepping up quite a bit to um, an enterprise solution. So you can definitely build today a scale-out uh, cluster. Um, this requires multiple servers and an external storage array. Um, these you can scale the individual components, of course, within a single, uh, within a single uh, initial configuration. You scale it out uh, horizontally, and of course you build a larger uh, cluster. Uh, this is all workable. Again, technology that works today, it's uh, great for high availability, but you're missing the uh, simplicity and low cost. So what we're talking about is how to solve this problem. And the cluster in a box is designed to be a building block that does just that. So let's talk about how it would be used as a building block, uh, starting with a cluster in a box. Two configurations. This first one is about storage. Talked about the ability to build out a great file server um, using technology like RDMA to go at bus and wire speeds. Um, when you start out with it, you start out with a single box. Um, you can, of course, scale it vertically. And typically with storage, slightly different needs. What you're going to be looking at is adding more internal storage, staying inside the box. You'll be adding external storage. That's the reason why it was so important to have external expansion ports. And you can also upgrade to RDMA NICs, given to get the kind of results that Jose was showing in his portion of the talk. Um, now, to scale it out, this is where things get a little bit different. You don't scale this uh, horizontally to get availability anymore. You have that already in the box. So what you're actually talking about scaling out is scaling out capacity. Now, there's a couple of ways to do that. You can go the enterprise approach that's done today, where you simply use these boxes as hardware building blocks, add your software expertise to build out a larger single cluster. However, what we think actually will happen in the volume market is something different. Since you're no longer trying to solve the availability problem, you're really solving a capacity issue, then what you really can do is add another cluster. Now, you take a little bit more time because you have to deal with managing the sharing of resources between the clusters, but you get to take advantage of all the ease of purchase, ease of deployment of the cluster in a box solution uh, that you purchased originally. Um, however, once you're in this mode and you're adding capacity, having multiple clusters actually can give you a little bit of, a little bit of flexibility. So, for example, if you're, doing, um, if you're using this to support a storage server across a large array of Hyper-V servers, you now can migrate the storage. So, for example, if you've gone to the um, Hyper-V uh, sessions here at the conference, you'll know something about um, the new, the new uh, live, my, live storage migration available in Windows Server 2012. Well, by having availability in your clusters, you can now migrate your storage and have an availability story throughout the process. So if you need to upgrade, if you need to do servicing, you can now move your storage around by, uh, from cluster to cluster, all supported in Windows Server 2012, and have a full availability story. Now, the next uh, version of this is as a standalone Hyper-V appliance. A little bit different consideration, the same idea. It's really the same hardware. Uh, this is one of the, one of the nice things about this. Um, when you have the same kind of storage uh, and server functionality together, you can use the same kind of hardware. Scale vertically, a little bit different consideration. Here you're talking about scaling the workload along with the hardware. So you're going to be looking at things like adding CPU cores, upgrading the, uh, the memory, and then doing something to scale the storage along with it. When you're scaling out, it's the same kind of thing. You already have an availability story. So what you're really doing is adding capacity to run additional VMs to run your business. So you can add additional clusters. Um, and with the same line of thinking, you now have availability. 
you now have multiple clusters, you now have a path that gets you to live migration of both the storage and the workloads, and you're also nicely set up to be able to take advantage of disaster recovery. Uh, one of the sessions in this, in this conference is about uh, Hyper-V replica. I think, I think it's coming um, on Friday. And if you learn about that, you learn that we have in the box a simple, but this is what's been kind of requested by all of you, basically, is the ability to have something end-to-end -end in the box to give you a form of disaster recovery. By having your workloads spread across clusters, you're now in a position where you can set up that as an incremental addition to your shop's capabilities. All in all, the main thing to look at here is that it's different when you think of availability as being built into the box. Just as it was different when you have uh, multiprocessing built in, when you have networking capabilities built in, when you have availability in the box, it really makes a difference. So combining the volume requirement of simplicity and low cost with high availability means that you're now looking at the starting point being availability. And if nothing else, take away the message here that that really does change the game. When you're no longer having to worry about the fundamentals of uptime, and now can move on and assume you have that, you're now starting to enter the world that people want to go to, even when they're going to the cloud. If you think of the dreams and the, that people have had about what it means to have fully enabled cloud computing, if you think about the kinds of things that you saw at the keynote in this conference, a lot of it starts with the assumption that you have access to your data and you have access to your applications and they're running. It all goes down to the stuff has to run somewhere. It runs on a piece of hardware, and you have some hardware in your own shop. When you're able to assume that hardware is available, and you're able to now use that going forward, you're now opening the door. Think of it as a gateway technology. If you have availability, you can now start talking about keeping your business up and running 24-7. You can start thinking more about what it means to have disaster recovery capabilities. You can start to have a feeling for where you can go just as you did with previous technologies when you, had, when you were able to stop worrying about it. So hopefully in the end, this means the conversation is completely changing. So what we're trying to basically tell you is that look at the stuff, that you're, look at the stuff on the Tech Expo floor. Look at some of the solutions that are available there. Come by the rack at, the, uh, at our high availability station on the, on the show floor at the Technical Learning Center. Um, find out more about what's available. There are some other sessions that are going to be using the live rack. So there's a couple of them have already happened, so look those up um, on once the conference is over. Um, there's a couple sessions coming up Thursday and Friday that are also going to make use of it. Uh, we'll be available at the uh, Technical Learning Center, um, also tomorrow night at the uh, Ask the Expert session. Um, and of course, uh, well, the other thing I wanna, one of the things I want to leave you with is please give feedback on the session. Uh, it takes a lot of work to bring these kinds of hardware to show you um, and uh, give you the kind of feel for the features. So if you love it, let us know. It helps, uh, helps us set up for next time. If you think we can do better, let us know. These shows are for you to get the kind of information you need. So in closing, um, there's a lot going on in the industry today. The technology is converging, servers, storage, availability. This transition is happening. We're doing a huge amount to bring it with you, not only in Windows Server 2012, but with the hardware industry. So it's a great time to be in this industry. Um, however, these solutions are new. They're coming out from partners you know well. Um, there'll be a huge new assortment of choices you have to build differently and to think differently about the way you're implementing uh, your shop. So it's a great time to be a customer, too. So please, take advantage of this. Learn about it. Uh, learn about Server 2012 while you're here. Thank you very much.